So last time we talked a little bit about Mead and Cooley and the way that they looked at the self as a kind of social and communicative process. Um, I understand that that probably comes off as a bit abstract and um, uh, maybe a little bit conceptually challenging, but again, if any of that is, is unclear, you know, I encourage you guys to, uh, to follow up with me and, and to, um, to refer back to the chapter and refer back to the supplemental readings. But, um, um, you know, trust me, the more you spend time working through it, the easier it becomes to sort of uh, see it and understand it as it's, as it's meant to be. Um, the second set of theories uh, that consider the self as a social structure, I think, are a little bit more straightforward. I think these are a little bit easier to kind of wrap our heads around. Um, so in the years following the work of Cooley and especially Mead, Mead turns out to be really, really influential in part because one of his students, uh, a, guy named, a guy by the name of Bloomer, um, writes a book um, um, called Symbolic Interaction. He takes, he was a student of Mead um, and he took Mead's theories and he took Mead's ideas and he kind of built them into a coherent a uh, theoretical and methodological framework called symbolic interaction, which is where that where that uh, um, um, that particular kind of social psychology comes from. Um, highly ethnographic, right? It's based on um, observing people's behavior in the environments where those behaviors occur. It, it, it involves uh, um, um, building uh, the narratives and the stories of the people. Um, um, in social uh, contexts and 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 um, um, talking to them about the meanings that they um, uh, they have of of the way that the world operates, it's a, a, um, a really kind of interesting and unique sort of methodological approach that is grounded in um, the everyday um, process through which people um, interpret the world around them and then act accordingly. Um, based on those interpretations, right? So that, that's kind of the, the, the methodological and theoretical tradition that gets started uh, with the work of, of Cooley and, and especially Mead. In response to this, uh, a number of theorists, um, in really beginning in the 1940s, um, they go down a slightly different path. They're much more interested in understanding the self um, as a concept, as a structure. Uh, they're interested in generating a, um, uh, a more, what they see as a more empirically grounded and quantitative model of the self. Uh, so they, they lend themselves to um, um, work that involves a lot of self-reporting and, and more um, um, experimental kinds of, of, of approaches to understanding the self. Um, but really at the end of the day, what they are going to be mostly focused on is, um, what we, what we call the self-concept. So to put that in terms that, that Mead would understand or that Mead would, would discuss, um, when it comes to the I and the me, these guys are going to look at the me. They're going to look at that thing that you think of when you think of yourself, right? So if you are the active source of behavior, in this case thought, um, and you think about yourself, that object, that thing that you are thinking about, that's the self-concept. Uh, so these, these guys are really, really interested in looking at what that is, right? What is that object? What is that thing that you're looking at when you think about yourself? Um, and so they're going to focus on that structure and say, let's, let's build a social psychology around understanding that. Um, there are a lot of people working in this tradition. I think two of the biggest would be people like Manfred Kuhn and Louis Zerker, right? Two very prominent theorists who, uh, who who do work in this area. We sometimes, because they are interactionists, they are definitely social interactionists, um, but they are really, really interested in thinking about the self as a social structure. We sometimes call them structural interactionists, um, which I'm not sure if it was meant to be tongue in cheek or not, but um, Generally speaking, I think there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, a wink and a nod there that that's kind of a, 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 a gentle ribbing. Um, 
These are the guys who are working in, in um, the University of Indiana and the University of Iowa. So remember back toward the beginning of the semester, we talked about the Chicago School and the Iowa-Indiana School of Social Psychology. Cooley, sort of an outlier, but he would probably be most closely associated with uh, the Chicago School. But within the Chicago School, it's definitely people like Mead and Bloomer and Strauss and, and others like that. Um, um, and then in response to that, Kuhn and Zerker and, and, and a few others form what we, we come to call, we've come to call the Iowa-Indiana School. Um, again, that's really inside baseball. You guys don't really need to know that too much. It's just kind of an interesting element of the history of the discipline. So, as I said, these guys are really interested in understanding this self-concept. And this self-concept is probably best thought of as sort of the overarching view that we have of ourselves as a physical, a social, a moral, excuse me, or a spiritual being. And one of the things that they did was they developed um, um, methods uh, intended to, to isolate and, and measure and quantify and understand the, the self-concept. Um, one of the most famous of these was something called the 20 Statements Test. This is something that Manfred Kuhn, Manfred Kuhn develops. Um, the 20 Statements Test is exactly what it sounds like. It, it is a piece of paper, and you are given this piece of paper as somebody who is participating in this research, and you are asked to complete um, 20 times a sentence that begins with I am. Right, So I am a sociologist. I am a college professor. I am a Cubs fan. I am 55, right? So you would, you would go through there and you would just, you know, all the things that you think of um, that describe you, you would put down in this 20 statements test. And then what these guys would do is they would look at your responses and they would say, all right, so into what categories can we organize these self-responses? And, and they called them modes of self-response. Just mode is, is a way of talking about like a, a pattern, a recurring pattern or something. So um, some self-responses uh, could be considered physical self-concept responses. So if you talk about yourself as tall, or you talk about yourself in terms of um, your age, or your, 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 um, um, your weight, or your, uh, your, your race, right? You're, you're probably talking about yourself mostly in physical terms. Um, social self-concept responses would be things like your social positions, right? If you talk about yourself as a sociologist or a college professor, those are social understandings or social self-concepts. If you talk about yourself in terms of your dispositions, I'm an optimist, I'm a cynic, I'm hopeful, right? Those would be called reflective self-concept responses. Be very careful, just as a side note. In the previous video and the video before that, uh, I, I made mention of reflexive behavior, which is behavior where you're directing action toward yourself, specifically thought. Don't get that confused with reflective. Right, That's a very different thing, so sometimes students get tripped up there. Um, so back to these, uh, back to these uh, structural interactionists. When you talk about yourself in terms of your dispositions, you're, you're, you're making what are called reflex, uh, reflective self-concept responses. Um, and then, of course, the final category or the final mode of self-response is something called an oceanic self-response. Um, this one's a little tricky, but basically it's it's anything that doesn't fit neatly into those first three categories for sure, but it also is a set of responses that don't really give the 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 they don't really give a person a sense of what you might do. Right? If you if you were to put down that you are a a a, a college professor, somebody looking at that and saying, "Okay, if 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 Jim's Self-concept is that of a college professor. We can reasonably expect that he teaches classes, he engages in scholarship and research, all the things that we've associated with with college professors. There's some implication for our behavior that is associated with that particular mode of self-concept response. Um, 
if I were to say I'm a cynic or I'm an optimist, right? You could make some reasonable inferences about the kinds of behaviors I might engage in if that is, you know, a part of my a part of my self-concept. If I were to say something like I'm a child of the universe, which is something I'm perfectly free to say, um and I, you know, it might describe me in some way, uh, but not in a way that gives anybody a clear sense of, of how I might behave, right? So those kinds of responses ended up in this category called uh, oceanic self-concept responses. Um, it's really tempting sometimes to think about it as kind of a remainder category, right? Anything that we can't fit into those first three. But there's some, there's some empirical rigor to, to, to the to the, to the definition of this, this fourth category, which is, again, responses that don't give any clear indication of what kinds of behaviors we might expect from a person with this kind of a self-concept. So, so Kuhn um, and other researchers working with him, they, they develop these, these 20 statements tests and they go out there and they measure um, countless, uh, um, mostly undergraduate students in social psychology classes, right? So all that weird bias population stuff that we talked about in the Johnson reading. Um, but, you know, some useful stuff, right? It, it, you know, the idea that we could apply some scrutiny, some analytical um, scrutiny to the, to the self-concept, to the me, um, has, I think, some, some real, real value, right? And one of the things we see is that some people have an overwhelmingly physical self-concept. Other people have an overwhelmingly social self-concept. Um, there are a couple of things to keep in mind, some caveats, but, but interesting and informative ones. Um, one of the things that, that was um, kind of revealed as more and more research of this sort took place over a period of time is that the broad aggregate self-concept in, in the United States changed over time. So, you know, at a point in time, you know, the, the aggregate data from, from all of the research on self-concepts might suggest that people in the United States tended to see themselves in social terms. But, um, say, in the 1970s and the 1980s, we begin to see a shift and people start to see themselves uh, mostly in 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 um, physical terms, right? That corresponds with uh, a period of time in which people were paying a lot more attention to physical fitness and and their bodies and and exercise. It was kind of coincidental with the emergence of of uh, you know public gymnasiums and health centers and spas and places like that. So Lewis Zerker, um, kind of picking up on that, started talking about something he called the mutable self. Um, which is the idea of a self-concept that's kind of highly adaptive to rapid social and cultural change. So as the society around us is changing in structural and cultural ways, our self-concept, not individually, but you know, as a country, the, the, the aggregate kind of self-concepts are going to shift to reflect that. And that was a very interesting and I think ultimately a very um, useful sort of recognition and insight that that... Um, our sense of self, even when we're self-reporting, like I am a sociologist, I am, you know, um, um, fit, or I am unhealthy, or I am a pessimist, I am an optimist, right? All of that self-reporting stuff itself is connected to the broader sense of ourself that's a function of, of what society is encouraging us to focus on, right, as, as, a, as a member of society. Um, we're susceptible to to the broad shifts in, in social and cultural changes. Another thing uh, that these researchers kind of came across was um, a recognition of, of something we call identity salience. Um, so identity salience has to do with the rank or the prominence of a specific identity or a specific self-concept in our hierarchy of self-concepts. Um, so, you know, a parent... Um, well, let's step back. If you were to do this 20 statements test in class, there's a very good chance that somewhere toward the top of that list would, would be student. Uh, but if you were to do that 20 statements test at work, right, probably your status as an employee would be closer to the top. Um, you might somewhere down the list also mention that you're a student. 
Um, but um, you know, again, this idea that the self is kind of the self concept is kind of sensitive to um, context. It's kind of sensitive to the place and time where you're thinking about the self um, would lead to you know the, the moving up and down in in this hierarchy or this this um, this this list of, of descriptions. Um, in some environments, you'd be more likely to describe your to, to describe yourself in this way, but in other environments, you'd be more likely to describe yourself this way. So that that gets established with this notion of the mutable self and the associated research. But one of the other things that kind of flows out of that is that that for some people, identities, particular identities or particular self concepts, would tend to be sort of prominently featured in their 20 statements tests regardless of when and where they completed them, right? And that suggested that for some people, particular self-concepts were always important to them, so much so that they would show up at the top or very near to the top um, uh, of their self-reporting when they talked about, uh, you know, what they think about when they think about themselves. And so, you know, this, there's, there's this notion that there's a hierarchy of self-concepts or a hierarchy of identities. Um, um, and some of our identities are so important that we're always going to kind of kind of move them to the top. And, and what happens, of course, is that people for whom particular identities are important, they are going to, you know, organize their lives in such a way that they can be that thing as often as possible. That was another thing that kind of grew out of, of this research. And the last thing that kind of grew out of this work that I wanted to spend a couple seconds on was this idea of self-esteem, right? And these guys also did a lot of work in, in developing a theoretical and conceptual understanding of, of self-esteem. Now, when we talk about self-esteem, we're talking about positive or negative feelings that we attach to ourselves and the judgments that we make of our own worth. And, and there, there seem to be you know, again, um, a lot of research done in this area, there seem to be three sources um, for self-esteem. Uh, the first is what we call reflected appraisals of others. Now, if you're paying attention, that might and should make you think of Cooley, right? So what other people think of us is an important part of our self-esteem. But it isn't just like a blanket sort of what other people think of us leads us to develop that view of ourselves. We're very selective um, in, in terms of who we pay attention to when it comes to these reflected appraisals. So while the opinion of other people is important to us and our sense of our self, um, we are also active in sort of selectively noting those those um, um, those reflected appraisals. So let me make that concrete because I realize that sounds kind of um, abstract. Imagine you have low self-esteem, right? You you judge yourself um, 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 to have relatively low self-worth. The reason why you can't just get a person with low self-esteem to abandon that sense of low self-esteem by talking them up, by getting people to say positive things about them, is that they tend to not pay attention to those kinds of, of, of appraisals. On the other hand, if somebody is saying something that confirms um, their sense of themselves, their relatively low self-regard, uh, they will latch onto that. They will they will pay more attention. They'll give those more weight. So so it's the selective um, um, reflected appraisals of others, um, right? That that if you if you have high self esteem, then it only takes maybe one or two people reinforcing that for you to kind of latch onto that and 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 maintain an elevated sense of self-esteem as a result, even though other people may be saying um, more harshly critical things about you and vice versa. So when we talk about reflected appraisals of others, uh, I just want to underscore the fact that people um, don't just simply accept the appraisals that others provide, but rather actively sort of shape them to, 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 to fit an existing uh, sort of model of self-esteem or a concept of self-esteem that already exists. 
The second source of self-esteem um, are what we call social comparisons. And there's a whole range of these, but, we, but, but generally speaking, you can compare yourself to others. You can compare yourself to past versions of yourself. And you can compare yourself to idealized versions of yourself. Then, so, right? So you look at other people and you say, where do I stack up relative to them? You look at past versions of yourself and you say, you know, here's where I was in the past. Here's where I am now. And, and that may either makes me feel better about myself or worse. And then, of course, idealized versions, right? And by this age, I expected to have these things accomplished. Do I have them accomplished? Yes or no, right? And that can feed into your, your self-esteem. So the social comparisons are both internal and external, uh, I guess is the point that I'm trying to make there. And then finally, uh, the last source of self-esteem are experiences of what we call self-efficacy. Now, self-efficacy is just our sense of being competent, our sense of being in control as we act in the environment and as we interact with others. So if you can do things for yourself and you can do them well, that will help feed a more positive and elevated sort of self-esteem, a higher self-esteem. Um, whereas if, if you struggle to, to successfully complete things, if you have low self-efficacy, it, it's easier to, to have a, a, a low level or a, a, a diminished sort of notion of self-esteem. So that's, you know, again, there's a lot more to, to, to all of this stuff. We're just, it's an introduction to social psychology, right? Um, but anyway, that's, that's, I think, a fairly decent introduction to the, uh, to the work of these, um, um, these, uh, these social psychologists who focus on looking at the self as a social structure. Um, in the next video, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Goffman and the, um, um, the work of social psychologists who look at the self primarily as what we call a dramatic effect. So, so this will be a little bit of a, a shift in, in gears, but uh, again, something that I think will be very interesting. So until then, um, take care.